Friends, your future may not be as secure as you think. Where will you be when the atomic bombs fall? You can secure your family's future by reserving a spot in a state-of-the-art underground vault from vault -Tec. That's right. Reserve your family spot in a state-of-the-art underground vault today. Sign up now and prepare for the future. Most of the planet was reduced to cinders, and from the ashes of nuclear devastation, a new civilization would struggle to arise. With the recent release of the Amazon Prime adaptation of the beloved Fallout video game series, I thought it would be a good idea to explore the games and their lore in depth so viewers can understand what made them so darn special. Following total atomic annihilation, the rebuilding of this great nation of ours may fall to you. That's why we at vault have prepared these educational materials for you to better understand the seven defining attributes that make you special. Celebrating its 25th anniversary in 2022, Fallout started as an isometric RPG, heavily influenced by tabletop RPGs. Created by Tim Kaine and his team at Interplay Productions, the original Fallout, a post-nuclear role-playing game, envisioned a world inspired by Mad Max, where bright atomic age aesthetics met the stark moral dilemmas of a harsh post-nuclear landscape. Set in a future where an alternative history diverges post-World War II, American culture remains fixed in the 1950s until a catastrophic war with China in 2077 over scarce resources ends dramatically in nuclear fallout. In the mid-2000s, Bethesda Softworks acquired the rights to Fallout, transitioning it into three-dimensional gameplay with Fallout 3, which was followed by several sequels and spin-offs. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained. And today, we're going to dive into the complex history and lore of the Great War that destroyed modern civilization and led to the setting and Fallout-ridden world of the games. I'm planning on covering the mechanics of the Fallout series, the story in each of the main games, in addition to the entire television series, in two more separate videos, likely next week. But for the purposes of this video, we'll be focusing on the events that led to the destruction of the world. Since the dawn of humankind, when our ancestors first discovered the killing power of rock and bone, blood has been spilled in the name of everything, from God, to justice, to simple psychotic rage. In the year 2077, the world was plunged into an abyss, nuclear fire and radiation. But it was not, as some had predicted, the end of the world. Instead, the apocalypse was simply the prologue to another bloody chapter of human history. For man had succeeded in destroying the world, but war... war never changes. The world of the Fallout series is a cornerstone of its unique charm and enduring popularity, characterized by its blending of 1950s American culture with a dystopian future shaped by nuclear apocalypse. This world is a darkly satirical, retro-futuristic vision where, despite technological advancements, society culturally remained in a post-World War II setting, leading to a unique aesthetic and social dynamic that heavily influenced the game's atmosphere and storytelling. Fallout's timeline diverges from our reality shortly after World War II. The key divergence is the retention of 1950s culture and technology that, while advancing in some areas like robotics and nuclear physics, never moved beyond the atomic age in terms of style and societal values. This led to a world where vacuum tubes and monochrome computer screens coexist with advanced AI and plasma weapons. What I've seen, the world was nothing but petty governments going to war, dragging us into it, and shooting whoever refused to clean up the mess. 
everything going to hell, but no one doing anything about it. But we thought we were safe. The Reds just kept pushing and pushing. Someone had to stop them. So I pledged my life to protect my country. But I only know a lot of innocent people died. I was just doing what I thought was right. As the 21st century progressed, global resources dwindled precipitously, leading to severe geopolitical tensions and conflicts known as the Resource Wars. The term Resource Wars encompasses a series of conflicts spanning over 25 years, from the outbreak of war between the European Commonwealth and the Middle East in April 2052, through the Sino-American War, to the culmination of the Great War on October 23, 2077. Notable conflicts during this period included the invasion of Mexico, the United States annexation of Canada, and the Chinese invasion of Anchorage, Alaska. The resource wars were primarily fueled by a global economy that was heavily dependent on petroleum and uranium. Petroleum was indispensable not only for fueling vehicles, but also for the production of plastics, fertilizers, medicines, and various other critical products, while uranium played a crucial role in nuclear fission, a major source of electricity worldwide. As the demand for these resources exceeded their supply, International tensions escalated, leading to increased nationalism and protectionism. The ineffectiveness of the United Nations in curbing hostilities became apparent when the United States invaded Mexico in 2051, following a series of economic sanctions that had destabilized the country. The United States justified its intervention by citing political instability and pollution in Mexico as threats to its national security, ensuring the continued northward flow of petroleum. This intervention, though aimed at securing energy supplies, did little to stabilize the US economy. The energy crisis continued to worsen, a fact that became part of the public consciousness following a television documentary that showcased the depleted oil fields of Texas, now barren and unproductive. This initial conflict in Mexico set off a domino effect leading to further international disputes and warfare that eventually engulfed the entire world. Despite efforts to control resource flows and stabilize economies, these wars only hastened the decline of global stability, setting the stage for the catastrophic events that followed in the late 21st century. The irony of these efforts is that they were intended to prevent economic collapse, yet they led directly to the ultimate downfall of modern civilization in the nuclear fire of the Great War. But those of us who served in Mariposa know something. America failed, not because of its citizens, lived clean lives filled with hardship in a never-ending war. Certainly not because of its fighting men and women. No, its leaders failed us. Senators, generals, presidents, all those bastards. Their failure almost destroyed all mankind. The European Commonwealth emulated the tactics of the United States by responding to oil price hikes from Middle Eastern exporters with military action. Heavily reliant on imports, European military forces deployed to the Middle East in April 2052, initiating nearly a decade of conflict aimed at seizing control of the region's oil reserves. Unsurprisingly, this war caused oil prices to soar, leading to the bankruptcy of many smaller nations, and culminating in the dissolution of the United Nations just three months after the conflict began. In 2053, the situation worsened with the emergence of the new plague virus, which spread rapidly and proved virulent. The US government responded with the nation's first ever national quarantine and closed its borders as the plague claimed tens of thousands of lives. By 2055, the severity of the outbreak prompted the government to contract WestTech to develop a cure. While no cure was confirmed to have been found, this initiative significantly advanced biochemical research, laying the groundwork for future scientific endeavors. The conflict persisted over the years, marked by significant events such as nuclear strikes that devastated Tel Aviv in December of 2053. These nuclear exchanges induced a global nuclear panic, heightening fears of an all-out global thermonuclear war. Amid escalating global security concerns, including nuclear exchanges in the Middle East, the ongoing Euro-Middle Eastern war, and the devastating spread of the new plague, the US federal government initiated Project Safe House in 2054. The project, funded through the issuance of junk bonds, was designed to create a network of fallout shelters known as vaults, However, this project was plagued by embezzlement and corruption from its inception, 
starting from the financing method of using junk bonds to the inadequate number of vaults constructed, only 122, which were capable of sheltering a small fraction of the US population. Importantly, the vault Tech Corporation was awarded the contract for the Substantial National Defense Initiative, and advances in construction technology enabled the rapid development of these shelters. However, vault Tech's role as a crucial defense contractor, coupled with the secretive nature of the project, led to numerous instances of fraud and mismanagement. The war eventually ground to a halt in 2060, after the Middle Eastern oil fields were depleted. The aftermath saw both the European Commonwealth and the Middle East devastated and reduced to ruin. The Commonwealth disintegrated into quarreling nation-states that fought over the scant resources that remained accessible. This prolonged conflict not only drained the participants, but also set the stage for further global instability. The end of the world occurred pretty much as we had predicted. Too many humans, not enough space or resources to go around. The details are trivial and pointless. The reasons, as always, purely human ones. The Earth was nearly wiped clean of life. A great cleansing, an atomic spark struck by human hands, quickly raged out of control. In the year 2077, after millennia of armed conflict, the destructive nature of man could sustain itself no longer. It goes without saying that the conclusion of the war did little to restore international stability. Amidst the crippling resource crisis and the outbreak of the New Plague, the United States sealed its borders in 2052 and took increasingly drastic measures to support its faltering economy. This involved the pursuit of promising technologies that were aimed at resolving the resource shortages, such as advanced robotics, notably the artificial intelligence system, ZAX, developed by vault Tech Corporation and utilized by the Department of Energy for data processing. It also included alternative propulsion systems in nuclear fission, with notable efforts by Repcon Aerospace, Mass Fusion, and Chrysler Motors. During this period, the US military received substantial funding, serving both as a protective barrier and a means to secure American resources. In 2059, the establishment of the Anchorage Frontline aimed to defend Alaska from foreign threats, recognizing its strategic importance as a key oil export route and likely site of future conflicts. The increased military presence in Alaska heightened tensions with Canada, as the United States insisted on the right to deploy troops on Canadian soil to safeguard the Trans-Alaskan Pipeline. This demand marked the beginning of a gradual erosion of Canadian sovereignty, eventually leading to its annexation. By 2060, the global situation had become critical. Worldwide traffic nearly ceased, with petroleum now too valuable to be used for personal transportation. Although electric and fission-powered vehicles emerged, their availability was severely limited by the ongoing crisis. Efforts to accelerate fusion research continued, though they had yet to yield a viable solution. The only modest success by this time was the completion of most vault tech faults by 2063, which began conducting drills in preparation for potential future disasters. Spears of nuclear fire rained from the skies. Continents were swallowed in flames and fell beneath the boiling oceans. Humanity was almost extinguished, their spirits becoming part of the background radiation that blanketed the Earth. A quiet darkness fell across the planet, lasting many years. The Sino-American War represented a critical conflict involving the United States and the People's Republic of China, the two remaining superpowers on Earth, who were locked in a fierce struggle to control the planet's dwindling resources. This total war involved not only the principal nations, but also their client states and annexed territories, fully mobilizing both civilian and military assets in a fight driven as much by ideological differences as by resource scarcity. Both nations committed numerous atrocities against foreign and domestic populations, with the war escalating steadily to include the deployment of nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons. This escalation saw both countries transition into totalitarian regimes indistinguishable from one another in their methods and desperation. Resource limitations dictated the nature of the conflict, leading to entrenched positions rather than fluid battlefield maneuvers. Trench warfare, especially prevalent in Alaska, resulted in prolonged stalemates until the United States introduced new models of power armor, which changed the dynamics on the front lines. 
In the United States, the impact of global resource shortages was somewhat mitigated by the nation's reliance on nuclear energy, which allowed the semblance of the American dream to persist longer than might have otherwise been possible. The immediate catalyst for the conflict was the acute global shortages of resources by 2060, when the last of the accessible fuel reserves were depleted. This led to a standstill in vehicular traffic, as fuel became too precious to squander in personal transportation. The automotive industry scrambled to develop alternatives, but their efforts in electric and early fusion vehicles were too delayed and insufficient to address the escalating crisis. The situation was exacerbated by the collapse of the European Commonwealth and the Middle Eastern oil nations, following the depletion of their oil fields, further straining global tensions and resources. The United States continued to decline, due to an increasingly troubled economy and the devastating effects of the new plague, which persisted despite intensified quarantine measures. The federal government capitalized on the growing national paranoia to maintain control, discouraging public gatherings, stoking anti-communist sentiment, and promoting the reporting of any activities that were thought to support communism. The Vigilant Citizens Hotline was established, enabling citizens to report their neighbors for any suspected communist sympathies. This period marked the onset of another Red Scare, fueled by escalating hostilities from the People's Republic of China and its activities within the US. Mr. Pollock went outside to see what was going on. When he came back in, he told us what he saw. Clouds. Mushroom clouds. It's finally happened. The end of the world. Tina, it's me. Your brother, Alex. You have to come home. Do you understand me? This thing with China, it's not going away. We're gonna try and get into one of those vaults. Look, no matter what it takes, the whole damn Keller family's gonna ride this storm out, but you've got to get your ass home. Now. Tensions further escalated due to espionage activities, with Chinese intelligence efforts aimed at penetrating US civilian and military sectors contributing to the onset of conflict. A significant incident in this clandestine warfare was the Niagara sabotage, after which Wan Yang, a key Chinese intelligence operative, was captured, marking a critical point in the deterioration of Sino-American relations. In response to these challenges, significant research efforts were launched that promised to potentially resolve the resource crisis. In 2065, the military initiated a research program aimed at enhancing the mobility of its mechanized cavalry units through the development of power armor. This led to advancements in military applications, construction capabilities, and crucially, fusion technology. Concurrently, research continued into developing more potent nuclear weapons, However, these advancements eventually heightened tensions with China. Heavily reliant on fossil fuels, the Chinese economy was teetering on the brink of collapse by spring of 2066 as global oil supplies finally ran dry. With the United States refusing to export its crude oil reserves, China's diplomatic overtures grew increasingly aggressive. The situation worsened when in the summer of 2066, the United States publicly unveiled the first crude fusion cell developed for the Power Armor project. Well, looks like one of its passengers left behind a seriously sweet goodie. We're talking a full suit of Cherry T-45 power armor. Military issue. What makes that power armor so special? A West Tech internalized servo system, that's what. Inside that baby, super is the new normal. You'll be stronger, tougher, resistant to rads, and get the suit. You can rip the minigun right off the vertibird do that, and those raiders get an express ticket to hell. Under the leadership of General Jing Wei, Chinese forces launched a substantial invasion of Alaska in the winter of 2066, marked by a significant airborne assault, aiming to seize its oil reserves. This strategic move enabled the Chinese military to seize control of Alaska's critical oil infrastructure, including pipelines, derricks, and reserves. The successful capture of these assets was crucial in sustaining the Chinese economy by securing a continuous flow of resources. Faced with these advances, the American military found itself retreating on all fronts as the Chinese offensive initially succeeded. Struggling to maintain its war effort without secure land-based supply routes that circumvented the Chinese Navy, the US pressured Canada for military access through its land and airspace. Despite initial resistance, Ottawa eventually conceded, 
setting the groundwork for the future occupation and eventual annexation of Canada a decade later. Amidst these developments, the urgency for an effective suit of power armor became paramount for the United States. In response, the US military and its contractors developed the first rudimentary model of power armor, designated the T-45. Despite its crude construction, the T-45 significantly enhanced the mobility and firepower of American troops. It enabled them to effectively wield heavy weapons, countering Chinese tanks and infantry more effectively. The initial deployment of these suits in January 2067 provided a much needed boost to American forces, stabilizing the front and even allowing them to reclaim territory from the Chinese. However, the armor's limitations meant that it only stabilized rather than turned the tide of the war, leading to a rapid devolution into stalemate. General Constantine Chase played a crucial role during this phase, leading to the newly formed power armor units to stabilize and slowly push back the Chinese forces. At the time, the threat of a Chinese nuclear strike was considered manageable. According to Defense Intelligence Agency assessments, a hypothetical first strike by China was predicted only to destroy 41% of the American nuclear arsenal, preserving the majority of US retaliatory capabilities. I can feel it wash over me. The heat, the force, the radiation, the fear. It's the end of the world all over again. I close my eyes. I see my life before all of this. Before the bombs. Everything can change in an instant, and the future you plan for yourself shifts, whether or not you're ready. As the war in Alaska dragged on from 2068 to 2073, it increasingly drained resources. With Chinese forces occupying Alaska and exploiting its resources, the United States heavily relied on Canadian resources to sustain its war efforts. Vast tracts of Canadian timberland were devastated as the military utilized the country's wealth to combat the Chinese across the Western Front. By 2069, the strain had reached a breaking point, and despite growing protests from Canadians, their complaints were largely ignored. In the view of many US citizens, Canada had essentially become an extension of the US, often referred to derogatorily as Little America. Tensions reached a peak when Canadian forces attempted to sabotage the newly reclaimed Trans-Alaskan Pipeline. This act of defiance, coupled with widespread rioting in several Canadian cities, prompted the United States to begin formally annexing Canada on June 3. In an effort to bolster its military capabilities on the Alaskan front, the US Army commissioned the development of Liberty Prime, a superweapon designed to assert US dominance. However, despite substantial investment, the Liberty Prime project failed to yield practical results and instead diverted critical resources away from the ongoing war effort. As the conflict increasingly resembled a war of attrition, China resorted to using biological weapons on the front. In retaliation, the American government tasked Westtech with developing a pan-immunity virion on September 15, 2073. Importantly, this initiative later morphed into the Forced Evolution Virus Project. With Westtech having been effectively nationalized two years prior, the scientists involved had little choice but to comply with military directives, pushing the research forward under strict oversight. Any humanoid that isn't inoculated against its effects before its release will die. That is the project. No, no, that's humanity's last best hope. That's what we've been working towards all these years. Oh, but that's one of the advantages of the FEV virus. We can release it right here, and the jet stream will carry it worldwide. It'll have plenty of time to cleanse every nook and cranny of the globe. A significant turning point in the Sino-American War occurred in 2074, when American forces, despite official narratives of a defensive stance, initiated a counter-invasion on the Chinese mainland. This escalation stretched the American economy to its limits, as US military personnel fought across three critical fronts, Canada, Alaska, and mainland China. The prolonged conflict, now spanning eight years, led to a deadlock reminiscent of the stalemate in Alaska. Battles raged in diverse locations such as Shantou, the Gobi Desert, Nanjing, and Mambisho. By 2075, 
the Defense Intelligence Agency entertained the possibility that China had developed stealth submarines, potentially explaining the mysterious reports of a ghost fleet by field agents. With the arrival of 2076, the war had been locked in a stalemate for a decade. The protracted conflict inflicted severe psychological damage, with many soldiers returning home, suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Despite the passage of time, Chinese forces maintained strong positions in Alaska, and the mission to reclaim Anchorage was nowhere near completion. Similarly, US forces on the Chinese mainland found little success in advancing, with key locations like Shanghai remaining under Chinese control well into 2077, after enduring prolonged battles such as the months-long struggle for Nanjing. Further campaigns penetrated deep into China, including those in Gobi and along the Yangtze. The annexation of Canada in January 2076 temporarily bolstered the weakening American economy, and the US military presence spread across Canadian provinces, enforcing martial law and suppressing dissent by lethal force. Despite these measures, both superpowers found sustaining the war effort increasingly challenging. The US began ramping up production demands in half the timeline for experimental projects. The completion of the T-51 power armor model in June 2076 provided a temporary advantage, with the first deployment of the T-51 Model B units in China significantly outperforming Chinese tanks, armored vehicles, and infantry. However, the Chinese managed to hold their ground and resist the incursions, even as their supply lines deteriorated and annexed regions began to revolt. Despite these battlefield successes, though, the US struggled domestically. By August of 2076, widespread food and energy shortages led to riots in several urban centers, prompting the declaration of a state of emergency and eventually martial law. US military forces were then deployed within the country to maintain order. Concurrently, China intensified its espionage and sabotage efforts within the US, targeting key locations like DC, Point Lookout, and West Virginia. This external threat exacerbated American paranoia about communist infiltration, significantly heightening anti-Chinese sentiment. As a result, Chinese Americans faced severe persecution, with many being detained in concentration camps, illustrating the profound domestic impacts of the ongoing international conflict. The labor crisis, especially acute in Appalachia, where automation displaced thousands of workers, exacerbated the turmoil. As families struggled to survive amidst rising unemployment, the federal government and military authorities effectively transformed the US into a de facto military dictatorship as they sought to maintain control amidst escalating internal and external pressures. Please recognize that the fate of our entire country rests on this plan. Sacrifices must be made for the greater good. A great many years ago, remnants of the government had a similar idea. The year 2077 marked a critical phase in the Sino-American War, characterized by significant shifts on various fronts. In Alaska, the relentless attrition disrupted supply lines, and aggressive US offensives finally overwhelmed Chinese forces. The pivotal moment came with the liberation of Anchorage, led by US forces equipped with winterized T-51 power armor units under General Constance Chase. This victory effectively concluded the decade-long Anchorage reclamation campaign, with General Jing Wei, the commander of the Chinese forces in Alaska, killed in action. The success in Alaska rejuvenated the American campaign on the Chinese mainland, buoyed by the deployment of the T-51 units. The presence of these power-armored troops, often seen wielding miniguns, initially led to numerous Chinese troops surrendering upon encounter. However, this advantage waned as American forces penetrated deeper into China, meeting fiercer resistance. By October, what had seemed like a potential rout transformed back into a protracted stalemate. Despite the extensive costs in lives and resources, with billions of dollars spent in a formidable standing army maintained through taxes and wartime revenues, the war showed no signs of a decisive conclusion. China, with its vast population and resilient military, continued to be a formidable adversary, while the US increasingly relied on automation, converting military bases into automated strongpoints and reassigning personnel to both frontline duties and suppressing ongoing Canadian resistance. Amidst the escalating conflict, the US political landscape grew increasingly unstable. 
The president and key officials, part of the secretive group known as the Enclave, retreated to an oil rig, expecting an imminent nuclear strike from China. This move left the US effectively leaderless, highlighted by the lack of government response, even to a rebellion by a US Army unit at a top secret location. One of the last reported conflicts of the war occurred in Mambishao, one of the Philippine islands, where American forces succeeded in ousting Chinese troops. Both belligerents gradually recognized the futility of continuing the war and initiated negotiations for an alternative resolution. Nonetheless, the absence of the US president significantly slowed these talks, prolonging the conflict with no end in sight. This period underscored the stark reality of a war that had become essentially unwinnable, with both sides entrenched in a costly and devastating deadlock. The world tends toward destruction, so we try to make a difference. We try to remind people why the Great War happened in the first place, and help ensure it won't ever happen again. The global thermonuclear conflict known as the Great War erupted and concluded on Saturday, October 23, 2077, a catastrophic extension of the ongoing Sino-American War. Within just two hours, the war led to the destruction of all involved nations, drastic alterations to the global climate, and caused billions of casualties due to nuclear explosions, radiation exposure, and the subsequent collapse of societal and governmental infrastructures. The aftermath transformed the United States and the rest of the world into a desolate wasteland, with lingering effects such as radiation, disease, monstrous creatures, and widespread violence still evident even two centuries later. The events leading to and defining the Great War encapsulate a dramatic and catastrophic sequence that not only initiated, but also concluded global hostilities within a single day. The war's rapid progression was marked by a series of alarming military developments that spiraled into full-scale nuclear exchange. In the early hours of that fateful Saturday at 3 minutes past midnight Eastern Standard Time, the United States Pacific Fleet detected unknown submersible objects off the coast of California. This initial sighting hinted at the underwater threats looming near American shores. A few hours later, at 3.37 Eastern Standard Time, a squadron of high-altitude bombers was observed off the Bering Strait, believed to be of Chinese origin, escalating tensions further. Compounding these aerial sightings, the Chinese stealth submarine Yangtze was reported close to the American East Coast, launching all of its warheads except for one, which malfunctioned, toward American targets. The situation intensified when the Integrated Operational Nuclear Detection System detected the first four missile launches, prompting the US to elevate its defense readiness to DEFCON 2. Just four minutes later, NORAD's confirmation of the missile launches irreversibly sealed the fate of the world. Acting on this dire confirmation, at 9.26 AM, the President of the United States ordered a retaliatory strike under the protocol scenario MXCN91. The counterattack was swift and devastating. Nuclear bombs were dropped on Pennsylvania and New York at 9.42 a.m., followed immediately by additional strikes along the West Coast. By 9.47, Washington, D.C. itself was targeted and struck, resulting in the catastrophic failure of most American strategic and operational facilities. Over the next two hours, a relentless barrage of nuclear weapons continued to be exchanged between the US and China, leading to extensive destruction and loss of life on an unprecedented scale in both countries. This brief but intense period of nuclear warfare marked one of the darkest chapters in human history, culminating in significant casualties and widespread devastation. The ramifications of these events would reshape the geopolitical landscape permanently, setting the stage for the post-apocalyptic world that would emerge in the aftermath. The primary arsenal used during the Great War consisted of strategic nuclear warheads, with yields ranging from 200 to 750 kilotons. Notably, the high-yield warheads deployed from Chinese submarines contributed disproportionately to the long-term environmental catastrophe. These were particularly devastating as they injected vast amounts of soil and debris into the lower atmosphere, creating a dense, radioactive fallout that enveloped the planet. This pervasive fallout drastically altered the global ecosystem and left a legacy of desolation that would persist for centuries, fundamentally reshaping life on Earth. Few survived the devastation. Some had been fortunate enough to reach safety, taking shelter in great underground vaults. When the great darkness passed, these vaults opened and their inhabitants emerged to 
begin their lives again. The aftermath of the Great War brought catastrophic changes to the environment, exacerbated by the extensive use of biological and chemical weapons during the prolonged Sino-American War. These transformations were profound, with significant alterations to the climate and ecosystem that reshaped the natural world. One of the most notable changes was the shifting climate, which dramatically affected plant life. Many traditional crops, including common vegetables and specialized plants, could no longer thrive under the new environmental conditions. In response to these challenges, survivors turned to cultivating crop variants that had mutated due to radiation exposure. These included forms of cabbage and maize that adapted well to the warmer climates of the southwest, while similar mutations occurred in the colder, northern regions. The animal kingdom was equally impacted by the environmental changes. The pervasive radioactive fallout, combined with specific mutagens like the forced evolutionary virus in New California, triggered widespread genetic mutations among animal populations. By 2080, these mutations had led to the emergence of entirely new species, which replaced many native animals that had either gone extinct or could no longer compete effectively in the altered habitats. One significant example of these new species is the Brahmin, a mutated variant of cattle. Once the initial mutations stabilized, the Brahmin proved exceptionally well adapted to the harsh conditions of the post-apocalyptic wasteland. With its minimal water and grazing requirements, the Brahmin became a vital resource, providing milk, meat, leather, bone, and transportation. This adaptability made it the most prevalent livestock animal in New California, and a cornerstone of the economy in numerous wasteland communities. The ability of such species to thrive in the new environmental conditions highlights the profound and lasting impact of the war on the natural world, fundamentally altering the biological landscape. The aftermath of the Great War was also devastating for humanity and civilization at large, leaving deep and painful scars on survivors. The immediate need to secure basic necessities led many survivors to form scavenging tribes, often resorting to raiding for supplies. The environment, heavily irradiated, spurred widespread diseases and illness, while the psychological impact was so profound that self-annihilation became a common response, persisting even decades after the war. It should be noted that on the eve of the war, October 22, emergency response units and elements of the National Guard were deployed, aiming to provide aid to victims and refugees. However, their efforts were critically undermined by the absence of centralized command, a result of the electromagnetic pulses that disabled most communication equipment. Despite initial attempts by the military to support relief efforts, the sheer shock of the nuclear devastation led to plummeting morale and widespread desertion among the troops. As radiation sickness took hold, the dire lack of supplies rendered any meaningful assistance futile, with whiskey and painkillers often the only solace available to the afflicted. Those situated away from urban centers, or who managed to flee the city shortly after the warning sirens, had a significantly higher chance of survival. Notably, Las Vegas remained relatively unscathed from direct nuclear strikes thanks to the efforts of Robert House, who successfully destroyed 68 out of the 77 incoming warheads. Though these survivors faced severe shortages of water, food, and medical supplies, they went on to establish new communities in the emergent wasteland. Key figures like Darkwater, founder of Junktown, Angus of the Hub, and the founders of Megaton and Diamond City became pivotal in shaping the foundations of new civilizations rising from the ashes. However, not all were so fortunate. Many surface survivors turned into ghouls, mutated by the radioactive fallout and thermal radiation from the blasts. Their grotesque appearance fostered significant prejudice and discrimination among other human survivors, adding a layer of social strife to the already harsh living conditions. A small number managed to find refuge in the underground vaults built by vault Tech Corporation under federal directive. Ironically though, these shelters often traded one form of suffering for another, as many vaults were the sites of social experimentation, initiated by the predecessors of the Enclave, leading to different, but equally challenging conditions for their inhabitants. The Vault Tech Corporation, under contract with the US government, designed the Vault series of survival shelters as hardened subterranean installations intended to protect selected segments of the United States population from a nuclear holocaust. This initiative was aimed at facilitating America's repopulation post-catastrophe. However, aside from a few control vaults, the primary function of most vaults was to conduct various secretive scientific experiments on the inhabitants, rather than provide refuge. 
The term Vault was even trademarked by Vault Tech to denote their proprietary brand of shelters, hence the capitalized form. It's important to distinguish these from the Series 1000 shelter and the shelters featured in Fallout 76, which, though similar, were designed for short-term versus long-term survival. The inception of the Vault Network can be traced back to the early 2050s, during a period marked by the Euro-Middle Eastern War, the emergence of the New Plague, and the collapse of the United Nations, which collectively led to a nationwide panic. In response, the US government launched Project Safe House in 2054, this massive national defense initiative was geared towards constructing massive bunkers rapidly, using innovative construction techniques to shield the populace from potential nuclear warfare or plague outbreaks. Due to financial constraints, the government resorted to funding the project through junk bonds, resulting in the commissioning of only 122 vaults. This allowed for less than 0.1% of the population to be sheltered in the event of a catastrophe. The costs associated with constructing these vaults were astronomical. For example, Vault 13 had an initial budget of 400 billion, which ballooned to 645 billion by the end of construction, exceeding the budget by over 150%. Classified under the new amended Espionage Act as a critical element of national defense, the project was shrouded in secrecy, which unfortunately led to widespread embezzlement and corruption. Despite claims of near impeccable reliability, with failure odds of 1 in 1,763,497, the reality often fell short of these assertions. vault Corporation secured the contract for these shelters following a successful demonstration vault near their Los Angeles headquarters. Rapid construction followed, with most vaults completed by 2063, although some, like Vault 13 and those around Washington, D.C., experienced delays due to work stoppages. Over time, ongoing drills in completed shelters led to a cry-wolf effect, diminishing turnout and further compromising the Vault's effectiveness in ensuring human survival. Despite their many issues, vault Tech achieved significant technological advancements and developed shelters that could effectively protect their inhabitants when functional. The company even expanded its marketing efforts to include newly annexed Canada, where shelter projects were just beginning. The company's success allowed it to relocate its headquarters to Washington, D.C., and host large expositions at the Museum of Technology to showcase their products. Through their promotional tours and the Press Vault Suit Award, vault Tech strove to maintain a positive public image, regardless of the underlying challenges associated with the project. The vault Tech Corporation's demonstration vaults betrayed the impression of sanctuaries designed to safeguard humanity. However, the reality was starkly different. The vaults were central to a national conspiracy that hijacked Project Safe House for sinister purposes, masterminded by what would later be known as the Enclave. Rather than serving to protect humanity from nuclear annihilation, the vaults were constructed to test populations under a variety of controlled conditions as part of the Societal Preservation Program. This program was essentially an elaborate data collection initiative, aiming to equip the Enclave with insights necessary to build a multi-generational starship intended for off-world colonization by an elite group, as opposed to restoring Earth, which Enclave projections deemed potentially uninhabitable due to nuclear war. This covert agenda was known only to select vault personnel, primarily overseers, and top-tier officials within the military-industrial complex, including the leaders at Big MT, the vaults were thus designed to systematically feed data back to the Enclave. In fact, out of the 122 public vaults, only 17 functioned as intended, serving as control groups. The remaining 105 vaults were subjected to diverse and often extreme experimental conditions to observe human response and survival capabilities. Some lacked sufficient food synthesizers, while others housed single gender populations or were set to open prematurely. These experiments were critical in understanding how to sustain human life under space travel conditions such as long-term cryonic suspension and the creation of sustainable ecosystems for food production, water purification, and air circulation. Even Vault 13, ostensibly a control vault, was used to assess the durability of vault own technologies. vault role extended beyond mere facilitation. It exploited the shelters as laboratories for developing technologies that could potentially reshape society, regardless of whether the Starship project succeeded. Vault 88, for instance, was designated as a testing ground for prototype devices intended for eventual deployment across the vault network. The company planned regular rollouts of new technologies every fiscal quarter, beginning in early 2078. 
Human subjects were even brought into Vault 88 before any catastrophic events, underscoring a disregard for human life in favor of rapid technological advancement. The prototypes range from devices that converted physical exercise into energy, to systems designed to manipulate the moods of the inhabitants or explore primitive forms of mind control. Ethical considerations were systematically overlooked, dismissed as obstructive to the project's objectives. In this grim scenario, the true purpose of the vaults was not to save humanity, but to use it as a resource in pursuit of greater ambitions. On October 23, 2077, the day the Great War erupted, the sirens of vault wailed across the land. Despite previous false alarms leading to a crywolf effect, the vaults sealed on this fateful day, initiating a crucial phase in a series of planned experiments. While the control vaults operated as intended, providing safe refuge and ensuring the survival of their inhabitants, others were not as fortunate. In the ensuing decades, numerous vaults failed due to the very experiments designed to test human resilience and adaptability. However, some vaults managed to not only survive, but thrive. This included Vault 8, which opened in 2091, following an all-clear signal, leading to the founding of Vault City. Similarly, the demonstration vault in the ruins of Los Angeles opened a year later, with its residents establishing Aditim in the area later known as the Boneyard. Another notable instance was Vault 15, whose inhabitants, after enduring overcrowding, left in by the winter of 2097, formed various raider tribes including the Khans, Vipers, and Jackals. The remaining dwellers founded Shady Sands in the spring, utilizing their GECK effectively. Short for the Garden of Eden creation kit, the terraforming device was made by a branch of Vault Tech called Future Tech, and was designed to enable vault dwellers to harness the wasteland. These modest beginnings eventually led to the rise of the formidable New California Republic. Yet the vaults had a darker aspect. As much as they provided protection, they also confined the populations within, making them susceptible to manipulation by those with nefarious intentions. A grim example occurred in 2155, when the Master's forces captured a caravan from the LA Vault. Upon discovering its location, the Master relocated his operations there, realizing the remaining vault dwellers were ideal subjects for his experiments. This led to an aggressive campaign by supermutants to locate other vaults and harness their inhabitants for the expansion of the Mariposa vat production. Decades later, the legacy of manipulation continued when the Enclave, architects of the original vault experiments, raided Vault 13 on March 16, 2242. The inhabitants were abducted to an offshore oil rig to test an inoculation against an FEV-based toxin. By the late 23rd century, few of the original Vault series shelters remained functional. Notable exceptions include Vault 101, circa 2277, Vault 81 and Vault 118, both 2287, and Vaults 4 and 33, both 2296, which still maintain societies composed of original dwellers or their descendants. Meanwhile, other vaults like Vault 112, 2277, and Vault 31, 2296, continue their experimental functions. Several have also been repurposed by external groups such as Vault 21, which has been converted into a hotel, illustrating the varied fates of those iconic structures in the post-apocalyptic world. Typically embedded deep within geologically stable environments such as mountain ranges or remote areas, vaults were constructed to withstand the extremes of a nuclear holocaust. However, in some instances, they were also built beneath modern cities to ensure survival amidst urban destruction. vault Tech engineered these shelters using their patented Triple S technology, safety, survivability, and sanitation, aimed at providing maximum comfort without compromising on safety. Constructed from reinforced concrete and solid metal sheeting, they were built to endure. For example, Vault 13 was enveloped by approximately 3,200,000 tons of soil at a depth of 200 feet, providing robust protection, whereas Vault 88 benefited from the natural granite deposits in Quincy. Each vault featured a formidable blast door and an airlock system, designed to withstand even direct nuclear hits with a mere projected 2% failure rate, though Vault 87's door was irreparably damaged by such a strike. Vault construction evolved significantly over time as Vault Tech refined their methodologies. Early vaults incorporated a mix of prefabricated elements and traditional construction techniques similar to those used in military and industrial sectors. The demonstration vault in Los Angeles exemplified this approach and set a standard for subsequent facilities in California. As technologies advanced, 
vaults became increasingly modular, featuring pre-constructed sections that streamlined on-site assembly. This shift was particularly evident in vaults on the East Coast, such as those in Boston and Appalachia, which were constructed entirely from these prefabricated modules, significantly reducing building timelines. By 2077, Vault-Tec's ability to rapidly deploy vaults was well honed, especially in geologically favorable areas like Quincy, where natural and man-made caves facilitated large-scale construction activities. This was often supported by temporary railways that expedited the transport of materials and equipment. Powering these extensive facilities required diverse energy sources, tailored to local geological conditions and the size of the vault, typically housing around 220 dwellers. Larger vaults like Vault 13, with a capacity for 1,000 residents under a hot bunking system, relied primarily on geothermal energy, supplemented by nuclear power from General Atomics as a backup. This dual power setup ensured the continuous operation of critical systems including air filtration, hydro-agricultural farms, food synthesizers, and water purification systems capable of converting sewer waste into drinkable water. Additionally, each vault was equipped with a comprehensive suite of amenities designed to sustain life indefinitely. These included vault-wide intranet connections for access to entertainment and educational content, incinerators for waste management, and robust security features such as heavy-duty doors and an extensive eye-on-you surveillance network. The central management of these systems was often handled by advanced computer systems, with the ZAX series supercomputers being among the most sophisticated. Despite claims of nearly 900 years of flawless operation, the actual performance of these systems varied due to the uneven quality of components. This was highlighted by the failure of water chips in Vault 13 and 2161, which were sourced from a low-bid contractor and proved inadequate. Vault capacities varied significantly, with some installations like Vault 13 and Vault 76 supporting up to 1,000 occupants through hot bunking, while others housed as few as 100. Despite the 122 vaults commissioned under Project Safe House, only a tiny portion of the US population, which was 400 million at the time, gained admission. The intended duration of stay in these vaults also varied. For example, Vault 13 was initially intended to remain sealed for 10 years, a plan that was later overridden, whereas Vault 108 was designed for a duration of 38 years. The Enclave, which later shifted its focus from colonizing other planets to reclaiming Earth, used these vaults to monitor and manipulate the populations within. They controlled and observed the vaults from their oil rig, sending signals like the all clear to Vault 8, prompting the establishment of Vault City. This monitoring capability allowed them to ascertain the status of other vaults, such as Vault 13. Those that were selected for Vault Life were promised a high standard of living in a controlled environment, starkly different from the capitalist society above ground, resembling a socialist utopia. This included a closed-loop economy designed for sustainability. Residents were assigned a unique 11-digit vault identification number and were provided with all necessary accommodations, including clothing and bedding. The provision of food and water was managed through rationing coupons in some vaults, with luxury items available via work credits. Dietary needs were met through hydroponic farms or food synthesizers, and water was sourced from purified local water tables. Personal clothing was restricted, and residents received a standard vault jumpsuit, although some customization was permitted for individual expression. Trash and corpse disposal were regulated strictly, with designated days and methods outlined for burning waste. Living conditions in the vaults included private quarters equipped with modern appliances like the Floor Suck Auto Cleaner and the Colonator 3000 kitchen systems. Residents enjoyed access to comprehensive libraries of entertainment and educational content. Education was standardized, covering basic and advanced sciences, with tertiary education leading to careers post-Vault life, exemplified by individuals like Doc Mitchell of Vault 21. Healthcare was robust, featuring auto docs capable of various medical procedures and drug manufacturing. Some vaults even had facilities for cloning tissue and organs. To counteract the lack of natural light, Sumu Sun system simulated sunlight, contributing to an average life expectancy of 92.3 years. However, vault life was not without psychological costs, including common issues like vault depressive syndrome, xenophobia, and agoraphobia post-exit. Security was tight, managed by a force selected by the Overseer and equipped with enough weaponry to arm a small team. Communication systems intended to connect vaults often failed or were never implemented, isolating each vault from the others. 
It is from these vaults that the playable characters from the games emerge, ready to discover what the new post-apocalyptic world had to offer.